everywhere now that we are starting to look, and the Kepler mission is now flying, we can expect to really understand that we are not alone as an Earth-like planet. On the other hand, any planet has a series of catastrophes it probably goes through. Um, I think the lesson that we have is the only out, the only way to, to extend the, the length of the biosphere is intelligence, just like the only way we can keep ourselves alive a lot longer than we normally would is through medicine, exercise, diet. I mean, that, it's exactly equivalent. Is what we have to do to our planet. I'm speaking with Peter Ward. He is the author of The Medea Hypothesis. Is life on Earth ultimately self-destructive? And, Peter, you mentioned speaking having speaking to other scientists in, in related fields about this. How, in general, have scientists reacted to this Medea uh, Hypothesis? Well, it kind of goes along lines of who does and who doesn't believe in that greenhouse gases cause global warming. As you probably know, the vast majority of people do understand that carbon dioxide is a very potent greenhouse gas, and yet there are still skeptics. And some of the skeptics say, no, greenhouse gases have nothing to do with it. That is entirely cycles of the sun. And yet deep time really does show us. We can see from the rock record what past carbon dioxide levels were, and we can also detect relative temperatures. Were they high? Were they low on the planet from geological evidence? There's really a tremendous correspondence between high CO2, no ice caps or ice sheets, and very high global temperatures. And so you would have to just invoke the most amazing coincidences to be able to say that it was every single time the sun and just just by coincidence we had high CO2. So it's not as if I'm running into a lot of opposition because much of what we're talking about in this book deals with uh, climate cycles. Let's take another call. Kumar is in Sorrento Mesa. And good morning, Kumar. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, I, there seems to be two views here. Until recently, we've been hearing that, uh, you know, we've been pumping so much CO2 into uh, air, and we have to control that and uh, try to make things better. Now, uh, there seems to be another perspective now that, you know, even if we don't do anything, nature itself has to be protected from uh, itself. So uh, how does that, in your perspective, change the green movement that we are in right now? Should it modify? Should it be enhanced? Or, you know, we don't have to worry about it? Okay, Kumar, uh, what, what does this do to everybody going green? Yeah, great question. The irony of all this is the greatest danger to the long-term survival and life on Earth is not enough carbon dioxide. The greatest danger to the short-term human society is too much carbon dioxide. What a mess. I mean, way off in the future, we're going to look back and say, wow, I wish we had some of that CO2 that we burnt up in all that coal and oil, because way down the line, we're going to have to extract it from rocks. In the short term, the greatest single threat facing our society is sea level rise. Uh, I have a next book coming out in about six months or a year. Our, our, it's about the rise of sea level, what it's going to do, what it's going to do to the Imperial Valley, to the Great Valley of California, what it's going to do to crops. We've got to get through this next two or three centuries. We've got to be able to engineer the atmosphere so that it allows us to keep ice sheets, Greenland ice sheets, Antarctic ice sheets. I just came back from Antarctica. I was six weeks sitting on a melting ice sheet. It's spectacular what's happening down there and very, very scary. And as you said before, in your study of deep time, you've seen what happens when the Earth loses its ice caps, right? Yes, the, we have 240 feet of sea level rise facing us if we lose the West Antarctic ice sheet, if we lose the other Antarctic ice sheets, and if we lose the Greenland ice sheets. Again, an ice sheet is something that sits on continental rock. An ice cap floats on the ocean. If they melt away, there's no effect on sea level. But the ice sheets, sheets. when they melt, have a drastic and quick effect on sea level. I see. We have another caller. Jack is in Encinitas. Good morning, Jack. Yes, hi. Uh, the way I've understood the Gaia principle is it doesn't have too much attached to it other than the concept that the, the Earth is a living entity. And in so it being a living entity, all these dynamics that you're talking about are possible. Uh, oh. That's a great question. Actually, there are several flavors or varieties of Gaia. That's the strongest Gaia in the sense that Earth is alive is the brand that is the most extreme. James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, the two who really codified Gaia, have now backed way away from that. What they support is something called optimizing Gaia, where the systems produced by life and run by life optimize for the future life. But we try to, at least the Medea hypothesis, really tries to test that, and we can predict 
that there will be a shortening of the biosphere because of a loss of CO2 that runs life because of life, and this is very anti gaian Right. Now, I'm wondering, I don't know if we've ever really mentioned this, that Gaia, the Gaia theory is named after the Greek myth of a nurturing mother, a mother that tends well to the life that she gives, whereas, of course, Medea is the one who kills the life that she gives. I wonder if it's possible that both the Gaia and Medea theories are partially true, that sometimes nature does actually develop self-sustaining systems and then sometimes chaos, chaos rules. Well, yeah, that's absolutely right. I'm not saying standing up here saying I have a total replacement because there's been a tremendous scientific advance coming out of Gaia. A, a whole field of science called Earth System Science has arisen. But on the other hand, there's never been a viable alternative to Gaia. It's as if it sits there, doesn't have to be tested, the only game in town. And as we all know, competition sharpens everybody's game. And so I'm, I'm putting a new player into this whole game here. <laughs> Let's take another call. Andrew is in Pacific Beach. Good morning, Andrew. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Yes. Um, I'm uh, wondering whether or not sort of making an analogy with uh, parasites, successful parasites don't kill their hosts, meaning they, because if they kill their hosts, they die. And the analogy being, if we who depend on, on the earth and its systems are going to be successful, we can't kill those systems. And whether there's any you know, um, value that p can be gained from a systems level looking at, at those, uh, how parasites are successful. Well, thank you for that, Andrew. What do you think, Peter? Well, that's a great analogy. Of good parasites don't kill but unfortunately, evolution takes a long time, and early in the evolutionary history of any parasite, they stupidly do kill. Uh, it takes a long time to finally codify within your DNA methods to extract as much blood as possible from that host and not kill it. On the other hand, we are competing with other life forms on this planet, and while we may really want to do the best we can to keep the planet good for us, other organisms, including vast fleets of microbes, would rather there be no oxygen, would rather that we have a very hot instead of a cool world. They're not doing it consciously, but we are competing again. And, and we humans, if we want to go in for the long term, we're going to have to engineer this planet for our comfort, and we will have to do it through engineering. Right. I want to ask you in, in the, the minutes we have left about this in engineering solution that you, ha that you uh, suggest. And I'm wondering, in terms of trying to slow the rise of the oceans, what kind of an engineering uh, solution might there be? Well, there's several of these. We, the, the, the easiest engineering solution is for us to engineer hybrids and engineer cars, but especially for us to back away from this profligate uh, burning of greenhouse gases. Chinese alone, the Indian and Chinese car factories, which are just coming online, it's not the cars that are the problem. It's the power plants needed to build the steel, melt the, the metals to produce the cars. And these are all coal-fired. So we've got this huge number of coal-fired plants that are going to continue over the next century if we keep going as we're going to be putting greenhouse gases up. Our first engineering is to stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere, try to maintain sea level at a point where we don't need to relocate our major cities, that we don't need to relocate most of our farms. And when you think of vertical sea level rise, a meter up, three feet up, doesn't sound so much. But think about this. Every three feet up causes many more feet laterally of salt moving sideways. And that salt, once it gets into the San Joaquin Valley, as it already is, can totally negate any agriculture for the San Joaquin. Do you think that we have a, an, a chance of stopping that? Well, there's certainly the consciousness we all see over the last five years. Five years ago, how often did you hear about global warming to the extent that you do now? People are waking up. The other hand, the last year has seen the greatest amount of information about global warming ever, and the new figures for this year just finished came in. There's been no reduction. It's 2.1% increase in CO2, 2.1 parts per million, actually. This is terrible. I mean, this, this means we've given it a good shot for the last year, and there's been no reduction. Well, even since you're coming at the whole environmental cause in perhaps another direction entirely, there's a lot about your theory that environmentalists seem to be able to get behind. Well, I hope so. I mean, in this particular case, that one of the engineering solutions probably should be engineering a way that there's not so many more humans in the future. <laughs> and that's certainly more than engineering, as you know. That's going to have to be a social movement. But we are at six point something billion. We're heading towards nine billion. 
There's a three-foot sea level rise already built into the system of the oceans. We can't stop it. Three-foot sea level rise intersecting a 9 to 11 billion population where we are covering over a large percentage of the near-sea level farmlands and croplands spells disaster. The name of the book is The Medea Hypothesis, Is Life on Earth Ultimately Self-Destructive? And Peter Ward, I want to thank you so much for talking with us. Thanks for the great and very intelligent questions from you and your your listeners. (laughs) Thank you so much.